any way that you can build a community and find a community in your area locally near you, I highly recommend to do. And obviously, these are going to be people that you spend time with and uh, you're in their home, they're in your home, because if you're leaving your tiny child with them, you want to make sure that it's somebody that you know and trust. Getting pregnant and giving birth are two of the most exciting things you can ever hope to experience in this life. The moment you think you could be pregnant, you're frantically searching for all the best information, which is why you're here today. I'm Stephanie King, and with my many years of experience as a professional childbirth educator, doula, and lover of all things pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, I'm here to make preparing for your birth enjoyable, empowering, and totally easy. Each week, I'll cover different topics, interview professionals, and get into the nitty-gritty birth stories from mamas just like you. And when you're ready for more, you can join me in the My Essential Birth course at myessentialbirth.com, where I take you step-by-step through exactly how to prepare your mind, body, spirit, and partner for a birth you love. So let's get started. It's time. The My Essential Birth postpartum course is here. Whether you're pregnant, just got baby home, or weeks and months into postpartum, this is the course for you. No more wondering what's normal for your body postpartum, if baby's eating or pooping enough, or how to get a good latch. You now have an all-in-one resource where you can click a topic and get the answer. Learn more at myessentialbirth.com forward slash postpartum, and add it onto the My Essential Birth course for even less when you bundle them at checkout. Already in the course? check your student library and add the course for the same discount. I can't wait to support you on your postpartum journey. Our reviewer of the week is Mad Dog 98 and she says uplifting and calming. I've only listened to a couple episodes, but I really love how every story is told. I love the educational side and the emotional side of the episodes. This has helped me feel quote heard in a way, but also realize that I need to keep learning. Love this podcast. I love that you shared it and I love that you shared it like that because yes, I love that there is some learning happening here. I hope that it sparks the desire to continue listening because there is so much to learn. Um, I don't think, I mean, I am a continual learner myself. I think even if I were to get pregnant today, there is more that I would dive into and want to know more about. So I'm constantly learning. Uh, I know that you guys that are listening are learning and I hope you're loving it along the way. It's supposed to be like a relaxing, calming, like she said, way to listen to things, hopefully entertaining sometimes. And without further ado... I'm actually really excited about today's episode because we're talking about preparing for that second, third, fourth, fifth, however many baby um, compared to how we prepare for that first one. And the best part about having a baby again or having several later on down the line is that you have done this before. So you know some of what to expect. That first baby. And if you're listening here, do not tune out. This episode is for you too. But I can relate because that first pregnancy, as you're going through everything, I mean, you notice everything, you're paying attention to everything, you have questions about everything, anything that's new is like the most exciting thing ever. And then as you work through that second, third, however many more pregnancies, you're like, wait, I recognize this, or when is this part coming, or oh, my favorite part was, and you have something to look forward to. There's also questions that are probably going to come up with the later pregnancies and birth stuff from what happened with that first pregnancy and birth. So maybe something, maybe you decided if you're like me that the first pregnancy did not go how you had hoped, that first birth maybe, pregnancy and or birth. And now that you're pregnant again, you're like, there are some things I want to change. Or I can hindsight look back and say, that went really well. I bet I can make it even better. Or next time I'm going to really be able to tell my husband or my birth partner that like, this is how I need you to touch me because I wasn't able to say it in the moment then. And I didn't know I was going to have that problem. So there's a lot of different mindset, different things that you can be thinking about. And I think it's actually going to be really helpful for those of you that are first time pregnant to hear these so that you can incorporate some of that into that first pregnancy. And obviously, if you're here and this is your experience right now, hopefully you're going to relate to some of it. And it's also going to give you some help. Now, this is another topic that came up from Instagram. I have been pulling you guys and asking you, what do you want to know? 
uh, what questions or topics would you like me to cover? And then once I get a topic, I'm asking you guys even more, okay, here's the topic. Tell me what are the questions that you have regarding this topic? And then we are making podcast episodes directly for you. So pay attention to those on Instagram. There will be more of that coming. I feel like that's more of a way that I get to connect with you guys because this is fun. And I love that I get to speak with you for 20 to 45 minutes at a time every week. However, I don't get a lot of like back and forth. And this has been a way that I really get to do that. So that's awesome. Obviously, if you're in the birth course and you ask questions in there and we get to chat on Facebook, that's awesome too. Um, or you DM me, that's great too. But this is really fun. So this question actually came from Caitlin Jane Desat. I'm probably butchered that. Anyways, but there were there were a couple of questions actually. So here's some that we got from Instagram. That was one of them. <laughs> that was one of the people. But she says, know that an average first time mom goes 41 plus one. What's a rough average for second time moms? I love that question. Um, and then it goes on. Is there a relationship to term of first baby and term to second? Example, first is born at 40 plus four. Any indicators that second could also be born around then? Oh, you're going to love and hate this all at the same time because the truth is there's no way to tell. There is nothing that's going to indicate to you or to anyone else that this baby is coming at any specific time. Now, let me go over what kind of the averages are, right? So again, the medical system or the studies that we take or when we grab information, a lot of this is done on a bell curve, right? So the averages... Um, they are, they also include the extremes of, and depending on how big the study is, right? An extreme of one way or the other can definitely skew things. When it comes to due dates or guest dates, this is going to be, there's a lot more um, women that we can say, like these women gave birth at this time. And so we can compile that a little bit better, quote better for averages. The problem is, Every pregnancy is different. Every mother is different. Every situation is different. Every provider is different. And so even the way you can have two moms, the exact same pregnancy going on, healthy, low risk, all of that, first time moms. Um, but even the way that the provider handles some of the situation, even the preparation of the moms, maybe, for example, pro provider, so I'm making sense here, maybe one provider is at 39 weeks offering induction and saying, we really can't have you go past 40, 41 weeks. And another provider is like, girl, it's all you. We'll just be here for, for the ride. You tell us when it's time to go. And if it goes 42, 43 weeks, we're right here next to you. Those are going to be moms and providers working together that can create a different outcome, even with the same situation for the moms. The other side of that is maybe one mom does some prep work and the other doesn't. Um, even, and I'm talking like, so healthy, low risk, they're eating good protein, all that stuff. So none of that kind of stuff to look at. But one decides to do in, inserting evening primrose oil red raspberry leaf tea, daily exercises, clary sage oil, acupressure points, nipple stimulation. Maybe they decide to like try to get things going. Maybe one doesn't. Anyways, so that is why this is great information, but it's going to be skewed depending on your situation. So on average, they say that a first time mom, healthy, low risk, first time mom will give birth at 41 plus one. So 41 weeks and one days is the average. Obviously, that means there's going to be some that give birth later and some that give birth earlier. That's an average. And take into account or be thinking of the fact that that average does include the women who would have gone past 41, 42, even 43 weeks and were offered induction and gave birth earlier than those times. So Again, it's just information. 41 plus one is what they say is for the average first time mom, which is so silly to me that at 39 weeks, all of you first time moms are being offered induction because, hey, we know what this really looks like, right? They do say that on average, um, the next like moms as they have subsequent babies tend to go into labor a little bit earlier. Now that's fun, but I'm going to tell you my story, which is... Don't you love that? I kind of love that I have these experiences, though, because then I can be like, this sounds great. And here's another side of things. Um, with my first baby, 
my water started to trickle. I had a little trickle three days before, I guess it would be four days before my baby's due date. He was born three days before he was due. I was in a situation where I allowed the provider to take a lot of control away from me. I offered that up because I thought it was the right thing to do. And so that baby, again, this baby was born by cesarean and stuff, but I was not, I did not allow myself to allow labor to progress on its own. I don't know what that would have looked like if my baby would have been born a day earlier or not. But all of that to say, my first one was a couple days before the due date, the guest date, which would have been 40 weeks would have been the guest date, right? And then my next baby was for, oh, he was born on his due date. So, and that was kind of fun. Uh, I did go into labor on my own. I did end up having an epidural, but I had a vaginal birth. So that baby was born actually on his due date. And I had pedromal labor for a couple of days leading up to that. I had an incredible provider. We were overseas in Germany, um, very natural minded, very like came in having pedromal labor, whatever, still was able to go home, all that kind of stuff. It was it was good. And then my third baby, <laughs> my third baby was born 41 to the day, 41 weeks. So none of that held true for me. I went the opposite direction. Don't ask me why. I think there were a lot of things involved. Also, if you know your menstrual cycle and when you're ovulating and maybe my ovulation, I wasn't tracking those things with those babies. I didn't track any of that stuff actually until we were trying to get pregnant again when we weren't instantly getting pregnant. Uh, when we tried for a fourth. So if you know those things, then that could be great. Like maybe some of my ovulation got later with each subsequent baby. Like maybe I ovulated later and that's why those pregnancies went a little bit longer. I I mean, I don't know. But in other words, like, no, (laughs) sorry, I don't, I don't have the answer that you want. However, averages do say that subsequent babies will be a little bit earlier. So However you want to take that information. I always tell moms, plan for the later date. Just, I mean, do things that make it so if the baby comes early, you will be prepared. Like whatever diapers, clothing, whatever you feel like you need. And that your your bag is packed at like 36, 37 weeks as a just in case. But plan mentally to hit 42 weeks at a minimum. Because then when your baby comes early, it is not as much of a mind game. At least I would like to think that because I knew that with that third baby and I've said it before, but the second I went 41 or 40 weeks plus one day, I was like, get out. Why are you still in there? Fine. I'm eating a chocolate milkshake every day. Okay. Now, what are some helpful tips when planning care for your firstborn when prepping for labor and delivery for your second for out of home births? great question question so she's asking if i have a baby at home what are your tips to plan for like who's going to take care of this baby and what's that going to look like for when i go to the hospital um and what if i need to spend extra time there and all of that so uh, my tips and this is interesting because we have been kind of all over the place and not had family nearby and in fact with my third baby i was like i swear this baby's coming early like i just i can feel it i know they're coming early of course that was my week late baby so i even like had family that came out early luckily they were able and willing to stay later but my guesses were not helpful so um if you have family nearby obviously that's going to be a little bit easier if you don't have family nearby well even if you do Maybe your parents are still working. Maybe there's some things that you need to work around there. But having that communication with them ahead of time and then having a backup because that person could get sick, because that person could have to go to work if you're in the hospital for a couple of days, um, just to provide for other things like that, make sure that you have a backup that can look like a mom and then your sibling is the backup or something like that. Now, in the case of not having family nearby, which is what we experienced with our second, so with my first easy peasy, nobody to watch. People came to the hospital when I told them to. With my second, we had, we were overseas in Germany and we had a little baby. Now we are, we have an excellent church community anywhere we go. We are, I'll just tell you here and I will put a link for it. Um, but we're members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I did not grow up in this church. I have not always been a member of this church. I found this church, um, as I was dating my husband and he was a member anyways, One of my favorite things about this church and its congregation is that everywhere we go, and it doesn't matter if it's in the United States or not, every single place we go, there is a community set up and um, there's different classes and women that meet together. Um, 
organizations of the church itself that allow it to be really easy to have people to lean on in your community. They're really, really good about that. And so what was really great is when we were overseas in Germany, everyone that was there, um, they were all displaced from their family, except for the local people, the local Germans that were a part of that church. And so we really, all of us leaned on each other for date nights, for um, babysitting, for hangouts, for uh, getting together and doing like joy school or homeschool stuff with our little kids, whatever it was, we were super good about that was a great community and it was really built up. So we actually had somebody within our church. They were a younger couple. They didn't have other kids. Um, and she had agreed her and her husband actually came and watched our son. Um, they had agreed that when I went into labor that they would come because we didn't have family there and they did and they were excellent and we had a backup. So when we went into labor, they came over, they made my son like spaghetti and whatever. They were super sweet about it. They slept in our bed for the night. And then when we came back the next day for us, we were just in the hospital that one day. It was less than 24 hours after he was born. It was beautiful. Um, we came back and and that was that. And so we had some food there waiting for us and they had taken care of my son and I was totally comfortable. So if you have a church community around you that you can build relationships with, I love it. Other people use things like mops or um, other ways to meet other moms that have little ones. Any way that you can build a community and find a community in your area locally near you, I highly recommend to do. And obviously, these are going to be people that you spend time with and uh, you're in their home, they're in your home, because if you're leaving your tiny child with them, you want to make sure that it's somebody that you know and trust. And lucky for us, we were able to do that with our third round. So we had two little ones at home. I was having a home birth. Now, in the event of transfer, what that would have looked like for us was we had family there during that time. Um, I'm actually not sure how that would have played out if I probably would have transferred by myself if family was not there yet. So that would have been a little tricky. I had a doula that would have gone with me, but I would have left my husband at home. Um, however, we could have swapped out the doula stays here if I was comfortable with that, if that's what she was hired for in the event of whatever, who stays with the kids, who stays with the dad. And in fact, that is something that I talk to clients, doula clients about when I'm doing kind of their intake stuff or we're meeting for one of the times where we talk about um, – in case of emergency, who stays with mom, who stays with dad, who follows baby, who stays, you know, where do you want people to go? And then just having a plan makes it way more comfortable. Like it's just, just like I say, and I'll put a link to this because I'm going to mention it here, but just like I say, you should have a cesarean plan in place. It's not because you're going to think about it and dwell on it and whatever. It's because then you don't have to then it's, this is the information, it's tucked away, it's here if I need it, but now I can focus on things that really matter. Same thing. So I would set that up in that way. Those are my recommendations. Another question, what might be different second pregnancy than the first, i.e. more Braxton Hicks, quicker intro of relaxing into the body, stretched pelvis, pelvic floor, carry the baby lower, maybe, and maybe not to all of those. I'd say Braxton Hicks, a ton, yeah. First pregnancy to second pregnancy, you notice them almost right away. I feel like my first pregnancy, and if you're listening, maybe you can relate to this. I'm like, I don't know what that really is. Like, I think I feel like my stomach's tight. I didn't, I wasn't sure if I was really having Braxton Hicks or not. Like there were times like I would go on a walk and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm like really out of breath. And like my stomach feels weird. And like looking back after I had had labor contractions, looking back, I was like, oh, that was totally a Braxton Hicks. And then with my next pregnancy, and this is really common. It's not just me. Really common for first time moms versus you've had done this before. You start noticing them right away. And they do. I don't know if they come earlier. Maybe they do. But you certainly notice them earlier. You recognize them right away. So I had some even in my first trimester. And I think it was like 12, 13, maybe 16 weeks, somewhere in there that I was like, oh, that's certainly what that is, you know? So Braxton Hicks are, are totally a thing. I do feel like your body recognizes you being pregnant quicker. And I think too, the closer you have your children together, the quicker you get pregnant after having your baby, your body is like, oh, we're pregnant again. Let me like bust out all of my fat stores and stick them all over the place. That is definitely something that I feel like happens uh, with subsequent pregnancies. And the closer you have them together, it's like your body's like, oh, we're pregnant. Pfft, you know, let's just pop in all the right places. Um, 
Relaxin specifically, I can't say, but it is something I noticed early on. So maybe again, you notice it earlier on. Relaxin is like one of my all time favorite things that we get from pregnancy. So your body releases this hormone called relaxin and it literally allows um, ligaments and things in your body to relax. And so you can stretch farther than you've stretched before. Um, just and, and, and it can be a little tricky. It's one of those things where like you It's why it's so important to pay attention to your posture and the movements that you're doing when you're pregnant because you can get yourself injured or a little bit hurt and uncomfortable because there's some overextension happening that doesn't normally happen, Um, particularly when you think about like how you're sitting and stuff or leaning like your stomach as it grows and you that curve in your back and you lean a ton forward. There's a lot of different or like you've had like round ligament pain. So like you like go to get up and you get up quickly, like from the floor, from a squatted position and like your round ligaments on either side of your lower abs, like all of a sudden you're like doubled over like, okay, I needed to take that slower. It's all part of relaxing, but it is my favorite. Maybe because I come from like the dancer cheerleader background, like a good stretch feels so good. So I really would like in the mornings, I was just like, I would show my husband like, look, look at how far I can stretch. Like this feels so good. Um, So that's definitely something that I love and that I think you do notice earlier on. As far as pelvic floor, definitely, definitely something you're going to notice. And maybe I shouldn't say that. I feel like the majority of women will. Maybe you're somebody who's really in control of that area. You're working with pelvic floor therapy. Uh, it, you didn't have any issues whatsoever in the way of like bladder um, in, incontinence or feeling like that area was really like pushing down and out. Maybe you're not somebody who holds that area really tight. So it could or could not. But I'd say the majority of women definitely notice things down there uh, earlier on and more often with subsequent pregnancies. As far as carrying baby lower, I would assume that that's something that could happen. But this is where I think it would be really important to, I'll put the three free exercises as a download within this episode, to be doing something like those three free exercises. It is so small and so simple that you don't even have to think about it. You just do it every day. But it's also Um, creating good habits and it's working correct muscles. So little things like that can help you carry your baby in the right place, can take um, some of that that tension and strain off of your lower back or lower abdomen, even your upper back. There is a lot going on. And so yes, that could be something. Um, I know we've definitely heard of moms that like, oh, this pregnancy, I definitely, I feel I'm lower. I feel like I'm carrying lower. I have that strain in my lower abdomen or in my back. And so we use things like binds and whatever else. So it could be something I'm going to encourage you to do all the right things so that it's not such a big strain. And some of that can have to do with how you're carrying. Some um, some babies like to sit up higher, some like to sit lower, and then how much weight you gain, which you may or may not have a choice, right? Even if you're doing all the healthy things, you've got high protein, well balanced, you're not eating sugar or, you know, whatever, like things are, you know, like you're in a really healthy state. Some women are going to gain 20 pounds. Some women are going to gain 60. And so if you are on the the side that gains a little bit more, yeah, it's probably going to be a little more uncomfortable. But those are certainly some things that are different with that second pregnancy. I think it was more fun too. I felt my kicks earlier. I definitely knew what those felt like earlier. I wasn't like, is that a gas bubble or did I really feel that? I felt those kicks earlier. Uh, that nausea came on <laughs> right away. I don't know if that was earlier, but I was like, I, it's like the second I saw a pregnant like yes on that test, I was screwed. It was, I was sick, Um, but I didn't, I shouldn't say it like it was a big deal. It, I had a great like 12 to 14 weeks and then I felt better because I know some of you are dealing with some serious sickness and so I'm not going to, it was hard for me, but there is worse, there is harder. So yeah, second pregnancy, I think your body and your mind just kind of knows what's going on right away. And so it's exciting in different ways. It's always amazing. I think one of my favorite things I don't even know that I've really shared about this before. One of my favorite things is when I am, I know I have actually, when I'm pregnant, I, I notice like immediately with that sickness, right? I immediately notice the feeling of having another spirit within my body. And if that sounds weird, it is what it is. But when I am carrying, um, my babies, my new sweet little soul unspotted, 
it is a different feeling. I feel like I want to be a better person. I feel close to that spirit. I feel their spirit. I can tell it is not just me. I feel closer to my savior. All of those things become very real for me. And um, there, I mean, there's nothing better. I absolutely love that part of it. So definitely some things that you will notice as a difference from first to second. Can these things lead to a faster delivery, faster pushing time? This is a fun conversation. Again, I am not the poster child for this experience. Had lots of pajama labor and all of the fun things, and it took me forever to do whatever. But generally, yes. Um, some of the things that we know, on top of the fact that you've done this before. So, and I think this is where mine got a little tricky. I had a cesarean birth, so I hadn't pushed a baby out before. And then I had a VBAC with an epidural, which was awesome. But in certain spaces or times, it went a little bit quicker for me for that second pregnancy. But with my third, I hadn't done it unmedicated. And so when I was going to push and it took me four and a half hours, had I done that before, I probably wouldn't have pushed for four and a half. You know what I mean? So I don't feel like I'm the best (laughs) when you're asking that specific question about faster delivery and all that. But I will tell you from personal and professional experience as a doula, as a birth educator, as talking to other moms, generally once that baby has paved the way and mom has done this before, Yes, you've experienced it before. You kind of know what to expect, even though things can be all kinds of different. Of the sensations that you've worked through, um, particularly for moms who are educated and really planning, working with their bodies, they're learning how to relax. They're learning about what happens during labor and how to work through those things. They have a birth partner that's really on board and helping, or they have a doula. Those women, 100%, faster delivery, more comfortable quicker pushing times unless there's something off like baby's got their hand by their head or their asynclitic or their posterior unless it's something like that then generally speaking yes actually the labor and birth time tends to be a little bit quicker prolapse if you've experienced it first time around what are things that you can do during pregnancy and labor to prevent or help with prolapsing the second time around additionally what are the types of prolapse I'm kind of wondering if this needs to be its own episode or like a bigger chunk of another episode. So what I'm going to give you here is just a brief answer. But if you did experience this first time around and you're concerned about it second time around, the first thing I'm going to tell you to do is get with a pelvic floor therapist. I think that's going to be your best chance for any and all of it. Now, depending on the different types of prolapse, right? You can have anal prolapse. You can have um, prolapse, like bladder prolapse. You can have where your uterus comes down, uterine prolapse. There's different kinds of prolapse that can happen downstairs in that area. So working with your OB and possibly other providers, depending on how prolapse things were from pregnancy and postpartum, getting that information first is going to be really important. If you don't have something extreme where it needs surgery or you have to meet with certain special specialists or providers in order to take care of it, highly, highly recommend and encourage you to meet with a pelvic floor therapist in person where they can touch and feel and test uh, and talk to you about even what you're eating and how you're using those muscles when you're sneezing or moving or anything. That is going to be your main go-to person because there are 100% things that you can do to avoid and or decrease that situation for yourself the next time. So I am not the person that has all of the answers for that, but that would be my best advice to you. And totally something that could be a great conversation with a pelvic floor therapist here on the podcast. So if you know one and you want to send her our way, we always, we have our list and stuff, but if this is something you've, you've experienced and you're like, I totally like, yes. And she helped me and here's how it all goes. Send her our way. That would be awesome. Are there any benefits for your body to having babies close together? Any risks? My mentality was that I didn't want my body to get too far, quote, out of pregnancy and breastfeeding before having another because I felt like it would be easier for my body to do it again closer together, but I didn't have any knowledge around them. That's actually really interesting. Um, I love this question. Benefits for your body to having babies closer together. I feel like that's something that is going to be on an individual basis. I think some women do well having their babies close together. Other women are going to have other women are going to have a harder time. And again, it's one of those things that's going to go from pregnancy to pregnancy. 
As far as risks go, it depends on who you talk to, um, who your provider is, and it would also depend on what your last pregnancy and birth looked like. So in the event that low-risk, healthy, first-time mom gave birth, had a great experience, vaginal birth, no risks, no complications, then the risks are going to be less than a mom that maybe had a cesarean birth or um, – and even cesarean is not a reason to not have them closer together. Um, I know that a lot of providers say, like, you have to have a two-year gap or you have to have an 18-month gap before you get pregnant. And that's not necessarily evidence-based. Again, it depends on the provider and all kinds of stuff. But as far as benefits for your body having them closer together, I don't know that I would say my body's used to this, so let's keep it in that. However, for your mental state, that may or may not be a positive thing. I think that's one of those that could go either way as well. So I can't, I can't, like everything in me wants to give you a solid answer, but I think that it's going to have to be personal. This is definitely just one of those. Uh, but I do want to encourage you that no matter what <laughs> you decide, which way you go, you can absolutely reach out to and talk to providers. But I think I think you're going to have to listen to your body. It's one of those things that you're going to have to trust your intuition, trust the knowledge about what you know from that last pregnancy and that last birth experience, and then kind of move into that next. As far as like, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about my mental state when it comes to my body <laughs> and having kids close together because I had all of mine two years apart. Um, my first, this is what I was going to say, because my first was a cesarean. And after I gave birth to that baby, I got pregnant at... I think I was 14, either 13 or 14 months postpartum from that baby. So a little over a year. And then I did that again, um, almost to the month with the next baby. So they're all like two years, two months apart. And I, I remember at the time when they were little and my husband was going to school full time and working part time and we were moving around and deployments and whatever. I was like, why did I do this to myself? This is awful. I am having such a hard time. And then as they started to grow and our situation, our life situation got a little bit better, I was like, I am so glad that we had them close together and like worked through that tough time because this is awesome. And now my boys are 14, 12, and 10, and it's incredible. And they are good friends. And I am so glad that we've had them when we had them. And I've talked to moms that have them even closer together or choose to space it. It's just such a personal thing. So whatever you feel is best for your family, trust your intuition and go for it. All right, here's another question, and this is a really good one too. She says, I know that approximately 30% of births are cesarean. Does this percentage consume mostly first birth slash is the percentage different if a mom has already had a successful vaginal birth? Okay, again, you're not going to like this answer. These are so tricky. They are such good questions. They are such important questions, and I'm going to highly recommend that you research a couple different things here, but it's true and correct approximately 30% of births are cesarean. The percentage goes way up for cesarean when we're talking VBAC because, and I actually had pulled some stuff up here that I just thought was super interesting. But, and this is from cesareanrates.org. So they do studies. They put some good information on here. I'll link it in the show notes. Um, but it says available CDC data shows that the cesarean birth rate was as high as 28.1% in the United States, reaching its peak in 2009. Unfortunately, 86.2% of women with a history of a previous cesarean birth have a repeat C-section, as many hospitals and doctors offering maternity services do not permit women with a history of cesarean birth to give birth vaginally at their facility. So the tricky part here is if you've had a cesarean birth before, your struggle is not going to be, can my body do this again? And can I have a vaginal birth next time? Your struggle is going to be, can I find a provider that's going to support that so that this can be successful for me? Because it's true that many providers, if you have had a prior cesarean birth, and you wouldn't know this maybe until it's time, like you're pregnant again and you're looking, you go to talk to your provider and all of a sudden you're hit in the face with, you can't do this, you're not allowed to. Um, the struggle is that a lot of those providers are not going to offer moms the option to have another cesarean birth. They're going to say, sorry, they're going to give you all the reasons that it's not safe or whatever, or we just don't accommodate that and they're nixing it and that it's just not an option for you. So I want to encourage you that of the moms that do attempt 
a cesarean birth, 60 to 80 percent of those moms with the most recent data, 60 to 80 percent of those moms are successful in having that um, vaginal birth after cesarean. So it's that's why it's important to look at the data, read the information, but understand what is going on on the back end. So that person, the percentages are going to be skewed. The 33 percent are percentages that do include moms who have had cesareans before. That percentage is part of it. Like what is our cesarean rate as a nation? However, some of that is a little bit skewed when you're talking about vaginal birth after cesarean, what that really looks like. So again, personal, worth it to look into the information, worth it to read through the studies, worth it to look at the positive studies that show the like increase in. And the great part too, actually, is as we, as I was looking through this, um, the percentage of um, successful vaginal births after cesarean are going up. They're like on a steady increase. And I think we're at like 17% as of 2021 for vaginal birth after cesarean. So obviously that's taking into account the drastic amount of um, providers or situations that aren't allowing for women to attempt. But it's also taking into account the very successful ones that are happening even on a small scale that are budging that number up. So keep that in mind. And if you've had a cesarean birth before, even if you want to talk more about it, reach out to me, but just know that it can be a really positive experience. It can be healing and you can totally do it. You can absolutely have a vaginal birth after cesarean. Here's another common question that we get. I had preeclampsia or gestational diabetes in my first pregnancy. Am I going to have it again? Or something like my baby had shoulder dystocia. Will the next one have it too? Here's my answer for that. So when you're talking preeclampsia or gestational diabetes and this, I'm not joking. I get this question a lot, a lot, which tells me a couple of things. First of all, that the moms that are coming to me have had this previously, which means that they weren't given, in my opinion, they probably were not given good information early on to know how to prevent it in the first place. And second is they're preparing for, they're getting ready for this next situation and they want to know what to do now, which is like the best thing ever. So if this is you, if you are either concerned about having preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, or you've had it before, the number one thing that you can do to prevent both of these is to have a high protein, well-balanced diet and doing 20 to 30 minutes of exercise a day, or at least several times a week, you know, four to five times a week. But if you can do it daily, do it daily. It's not talked about enough. It's instead of educating women and giving them that information. It's let's throw a baby aspirin at them. And I'm not saying that that is a bad thing or there is not a time or place for that, or it's not something you should do by any means. I think it should coincide with, I think we also need to include the other part of these things are preventable to a point. There are always going to be women that they do all the right things and they still experience these things. But then when that's the case, it's just like cesarean, like if you've done all the preparation work, if you did everything that you could and these things come to pass, then you can say, hey, I did my best. And for whatever reason, this is the situation that we're looking at. I don't have any guilt. I don't have anything that I need to worry about, about what I did here. So high protein looks like 80 to 100 grams of protein plus. And as we know, as we're learning more and more, the farther you are in pregnancy, so every trimester, you're going to need a little bit more protein. And I mean like up to like 150 grams of protein. Um, and so if you're having that high protein, well-balanced diet, meaning you are getting fruits and vegetables and whole grains, um, maybe potatoes during the week, we're learning a lot about beef liver right now. If you can incorporate beef liver, whether that's capsules or, um, or cooking it, if you really take care of your body that way, drinking your water, taking a prenatal vitamin, especially if you're not taking beef liver, then all of those things are going to lead more to a more positive experience. And in fact, there are studies that show uh, women specifically with exercise, those who have done it prior to pregnancy, like if you were just working out 20 to 30 minutes a day prior to pregnancy, you decrease your risk of gestational diabetes by like a big chunk. I can't remember if it's like 25 or 35%, something like that. It is big. So the those are the parts that I feel like are left out when we're meeting with providers. And the truth is, they are not given a bunch of nutritional training. They are not given education in those things. And so when you, if you maybe you've asked your provider before some questions about nutrition during pregnancy. And it's been pretty 
you don't feel like you get a solid answer or you don't get a really complete answer. I'm giving you that right now. And I'm not a nutritionist or anything like that, but I have read up and I do understand the powerful effect that nutrition can have on pregnancy, especially when you're talking about things like preeclampsia and gestational diabetes on top of having good energy, sleeping better, feeling well, all of that stuff. um, There are serious risks that you can avoid by doing those things. So good diet, good exercise. And if you're not doing those things, you you haven't been doing them previously, start them now. There's, I mean, you're only going to increase your chances of not having to deal with some of that. Um, But especially if you are like looking forward to that next pregnancy, start doing that now. Now, things like shoulder dystocia or um, conditions like that. So some of that, they'll, they'll tell you you've had a big baby before. Uh, or you've had shoulder dystocia before, you've had gestational diabetes before, like shoulder dystocia is just so much more common and whatever else. It's true and it's not true. Um, I really truly believe your baby does not grow, or your baby, your baby, your body does not grow a baby that you are not able to birth. Now, there are situations where gestational diabetes does really crank up the weight of that baby, the mass of that baby, and it can also at the same time, it may or may not, but it can, um, cause things to be a little trickier on the way out. Doesn't mean you can't birth that baby still. So those are rare circumstances where that can be the case. But oftentimes what's offered to moms is, well, let's just, let's do cesarean because we've got this big baby. So then we don't have to chance it. And you'll have to weigh those options and really trust your intuition too. Does that sound like solid advice to me? Is this something that I feel it's best for me to still work to give birth vaginally to this baby? Are there things that I can do to whatever, whatever? So that's kind of the stuff you got to work out in your mind. But just because something has you've experienced something with a pregnancy or a previous birth does not mean that that will be what is happening with the next one. Same with cesarean, same with all kinds of situations. So just the more that you learn, the more you know, right, the better that you can prepare for all of that stuff. So those were really fun questions to answer and a really great conversation to have. I have loved every second of this, and I love that you guys are getting back to us on Instagram. I'm going to encourage everybody that is listening. Um, if you haven't been hanging out on Instagram, you can totally do that. But if you don't, if that's not your thing, that's great. Email us at hello at myessentialbirth.com. If you have a topic or something that's on your mind and you want to send it in and have us talk about it. Um, We do have like a nice long list, but chances are if you're asking, other people are curious too. And it's really, really fun for us to have conversations this way. So go ahead and do it. And then I just want to encourage you, if you have been listening along here, if you like the teaching style, if you want more of this, come join me in the birth course, myessentialbirth.com. Um, you can head straight there or do myessentialbirth.com forward slash get started. We also have the postpartum course now. Like I said, you can get those cheaper if you bundle them at checkout. Um, but I love teaching and I hope that I can teach you as well. So until next week, I will see you then. If you loved what you heard today, the very best way to support this podcast and help other moms to find it is to leave a quick review. I read one at the beginning of the episodes and I would love for yours to be next. And if you're ready for even more pregnancy, birth, and postpartum goodness, come join me in the My Essential Birth course at myessentialbirth.com where I will hold your hand and walk you through pregnancy and birth step-by-step so you're totally prepared for a birth you'll love. See you next week.